Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Planning Your Summer Vegetable Garden Workshop. This workshop is being presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County. My name is Donna Olson, and I will be your moderator today. As you saw on the opening slides, this workshop is being recorded and it will soon be uploaded to our YouTube website. The link to the video and any accompanying resources will be on our public website, pcmg.ucanr.org. If you have questions during the talk, please post them in the chat. Somehow, Kathy? Yes. I got muted. Did you hear any of that? Yes, I did hear most of it. Okay, well, I'll just start and say our presenter today is Kathy Netto, who has been a master gardener since 2009 and is a dedicated veggie grower and also a composter. More about that later. I am sure she has lots of helpful information for all of us today. Kathy, take it away. Good morning and welcome to Planning Your Summer Vegetable Garden. I'm excited to get to be your presenter this morning. So let's take it away. First, who are master gardeners? Um, the purpose of a master gardener is to extend research-based information on sustainable gardening and composting. We work with home gardeners and we help you to make informed decisions and we try to teach you how to find answers to your problems. You can find us online in the media and special publications. If you have gardening questions, you may call our hotline or you may visit our website and submit questions there. You can find information about us on social media. We appear monthly in the Gold Country Media newspapers we have our own quarterly newspaper published by Master Gardeners, which you can access on our website. And of course, our famous garden guide and calendar. Now, during the normal operating season, these are places where you can find us at workshops, fairs, festivals, and special events. And we really are looking forward to getting back to doing these events and meeting you in person. So here's what we're going to talk about today. What's your goal? Planting methods, soils, seeds, or plants, tools, pests, and tips for success. So we all want the best tasting, freshest produce. And when you grow your own vegetables, you know where they were grown, how they were grown, and how they were harvested. And you know, in summer, nothing says summer like a fresh grown tomato. And when we grow our own food, we can try varieties that you may not be able to find in a grocery store. Growing our own food also gives us a chance to share with our children and grandchildren how food grows and where our food comes from. We create a sustainable environment and it's fun. Who couldn't be happy outside playing in the dirt? But like all gardeners, what is your goal? Have a set a goal and before you begin. For example, this year, my goal is back to basics. I'm my set a goal to be get back to basics, just planting basic things. So, you know, is your goal just to grow a few vegetables? Are you looking to expand into a larger garden? Or are you looking to become an urban homesteader? And I kind of loosely fit into the urban homesteader um, category. I do grow most of my own vegetables and I also can and preserve my own vegetables. Or are you just someplace in between? You know, you're gonna grow a little bit but not a lot. So we're gonna make a plan and set a goal. Here's some basics on gardening. When you're planning for gardening, you wanna make sure 
that you have a site that's going to get at least six to eight hours of sunlight. The vegetables, the fruits and vegetables, fruits are also referred, you know, tomatoes, pumpkins, squash, things, those are all considered a fruit. They need at least eight hours of sun. Your root crops need less and your leaf crops need even less. That's why most of the root and leaves are grown more towards the cooler seasons. You want a south facing, you want it away from trees, but you should have it fairly close to your home. And you also want to make sure it's close to a water source. There's nothing that kind of puts the damn thing on gardening, like cut, lugging buckets of water to do watering. And consider your draining drainage. If you live someplace where you need fencing, do you have the room to put up fencing? And also each yard can contains little microclimates, little, you know, the climate may be hotter or cooler in certain areas of your yard. Size. Size is important. If you are a beginning gardener, you're going to want to start small. You know, 15 by 15 is considered a small garden. Start small. And then if you, the more you do and the more you grow and you decide that you really love this and you want more, then expand from there. Um, plan your layout, plan your rows so that they face east and west. So once the sun comes over the top, you, their vegetables get the most sun. Plant taller plants to the north and plant your perennial plants together. There are some vegetables that are perennials like artichokes. And check your soil. Is your soil need to have amendments? If you're plant, especially if you're planting in the ground, you may want to consider having a soil test done. Make a garden plan. This is my garden plan for my yard. And I use this twice a year for my fall's garden and for my summer garden. And this also allows me to help plan crop rotation better because I don't wanna plant tomatoes in this bed. That's where I had them last year. So I wanna move them over to this bed and then the next year I can put them over here. And then these are all containers and trellises in this area. So I have a plan and I'll write in there what I'm gonna plant, where I'm gonna plant it, and how many of each I'm going to plant. I also make a list. Making a list of what you wanna grow helps you to stay organized. You can tell what you wanna grow. These are the tomatoes, for example, that I wanna grow. I focus a lot on paste tomatoes since I do mostly preserving. And I also, on mine, I will take this list and I'll put down how many of each one do I want to grow in my garden. Choosing a method to garden, if you're in your garden, you have to decide, do you want to, how much area do you have? Do you want to grow in the ground? Do you want to have raised beds? Or do you have a small patio and you just want a few containers, maybe a tomato plant and a pepper plant? The end ground method is the most traditional method of gardening. It's the most cost effective because you don't need any special equipment to build beds. It uses your existing soil. And if you want to change it sometime, you're not out a lot of money for taking apart raised beds or projects like that. So in ground is a great method if you have fairly good soil. But some of us don't have very good soil. I live in Rockland and I have a lot of clay and rocks. I use raised beds in my garden because it allows me to garden with poor gardening soil. But with raised beds, you can get it a little bit expensive by the time you've had materials and gardening soil. And if you want to know more about raised beds, there is a workshop on our YouTube channel specifically for raised bed gardening, but they're attractive. They allow accessibility and it can extend your growing season because that soil will warm up 
a little bit faster than in ground soil. So there's your raised beds. Containers are another option. Containers can be anything. Um, if you have a small space, you could have a, you know, a pot. In fact, you can grow tomatoes in a five gallon bucket. You could go to your local box store, buy one of their five gallon buckets, put a couple holes in the bottom, fill it full of potting soil, and you can grow vegetables in a five gallon bucket. It's very easy. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, this one picture down here is cucumbers being grown in a felt grow bag. And over here I have or oregano growing in a container. Containers are also great for curbing or controlling some of those aggressive herbs like mint, oregano, marjoram, which can easily take over your garden. Soil. This is the most important part of vegetable gardening because that's what you're gonna be growing things in. Your amendments and your fertilizers should be added before you do planting. You want to make sure that when you're plant, getting ready to plant your vegetables, you want to add those that compost, that fertilizer into the soil. You want to mix it down about a foot down into the soil so that when you put your plants in, they are, that stuff is right there at the root zone. They can start growing because they're in that bed for a very short period of time. So you get it in there, mix it in. Um, when you're doing this also, especially in ground soil, avoid using your, working your soil when it's very wet. Let it dry out a little bit. Working wet soil can cause it to clump. It can cause clots to form and it also can cause soil compaction. So let it dry out a little bit before you work it. You also want to check your soil and make sure it's at a fairly neutral pH. Usually 5.8 to 6.3 is a good one for vegetables. And one of the best things that you can do is add compost. Compost helps to feed the soil. And by feeding the soil, your soil has all kinds of things in it and that keeps that soil alive. And we're gonna discuss this in the next slide here. Soil is not dirt. Dirt has nothing in it. It has no living matter. Soil contains all kinds of things. You can see on this food web, you know, you have your plants, they, the roots go down, and then there's all kinds of things down here that have decomposed. And you have fungi and bacteria and protozoa, and all of those are decomposing things. And then they're fed on by something else, worms, nematodes, little bugs. They're eating that. And see, there's somebody's either eating someone and pooping. They all are a part of this life cycle that's in your soil. So if you go out, you turn a scoop over and you see earthworms, you know that you have fairly healthy soil. So soil is alive and it needs to be fed and feeding it compost is a great way to help nurture it. So let's get growing. Let's talk about plants. Some gardeners may want to purchase plants rather than starting from seed. And so here's a few tips about getting plants from your box store or nursery. First, I know that I've been, I've been to the nursery and summer vegetables have arrived, but please resist the urge to buy early unless you have a place to put that plant and keep it warm until it's time to plant, usually around the end of April, beginning of May. If in my climate zone, which is nine, these plants, if you buy them early and you try to put them out early, they're not going to make it. It's just still too cold. So resist the urge unless you have a place to keep it nice and toasty. Um, when you go to buy your plants, take a really good look at them. You don't have to be in a hurry. Take a look. Turn the plant upside down. Look underneath the leaves on the plant. You're looking for pests. You're looking for insect eggs. 
And you also check it over for, you know, diseases, maybe like powdery mildew, but you don't want to bring anything home that has a insect infestation or disease because that is going to infest your yard. So check your plants over really good. Buy plants that look healthy, that have some leaf grown on them. Resist the urge to buy the little tiny ones with just seed leaves. They haven't developed enough. Let them sit there, let them grow a little bit more. Buy plants that have a true leaf on them. Also checking for root development. Sometimes if you give the plant just a little bit of a tug and you feel a little resistance, that means you've got a pretty good root system and it's ready to go. But resist the urge also to buy the sad plant. The sad plant is sad for a reason and it's not gonna make it. You're gonna end up paying the same amount for sad as you do for healthy and happy. Leave the sad plant there at the nursery. It probably, it may have an infection. It may have gotten stress. It may have insect. So leave the sad plant there. Buy only the best, healthiest looking plants. And if you're buying in a six pack, double check that all six of those cells in that plant have a plant in it. Because sometimes it's like peas will bind up a little bit and you may not see that that one cell is missing a plant. Check that all of your cells in a six pack have plants. So we've talked about plants. Let's talk about seeds. And one of the tips is knowing your climate zone. I'm in zone nine, which you know is kind of a hot summer, mild winter climate. And for those people that are in a higher elevation, you're gonna want to know when your last frost date is. So we're gonna start looking at seeds. Know your climate zone because that's gonna depend on when you can start planting. You're gonna buy fresh, reliable seeds. Um, it doesn't matter if you buy them from the grocery store or from a nursery or box store. Right now, all seeds are labeled for this current year. Read your seed packet. See if it's something that will grow in your climate zone. And this will give you a jump on the season because you can get started now. And you also have a larger variety to choose from when you start from seed. Let's take a look at a seed packet here. This seed packet, they all have the name and the variety on them. They have on the back of the seed packet that has, this talks about how to start the seed indoors. It gives you directions on how to do that, how to care for the plant. Here's your freshness date that you can tell this is a little bit older packet, but this is where you'll find that it is a current packet and retailers will not be selling anything from the previous year. Over here, this is for direct sowing. So if you want to wait until the soil has warmed up, because the temperature of the soil will affect how well your seeds grow. Here it gives you all the directions, tells you how many days that the plant will come to maturity and start to produce fruit. Some seed packets will give you a count about how many seeds. And these seed packets, you're not going to use every seed in it in one year, unless you're sharing with someone. Um, these will be good for several years if you store them correctly. Your seeds will last you several years so you can grow this one variety over a couple of seasons. So that's on seed packet. This is where you're gonna cut a most useful, excuse me, a most useful tool. This is our Placer County Vegetable Planting Guide. This was designed by the Master Gardeners and is available for free on our website. You can download it, laminate it, or put it in protective sleeves and put it someplace where you do your gardening. I keep mine in my garden shed. And so it tells you when you can start your seeds indoors. And the general rule is about eight weeks before you're going to plant outside. You're gonna see 
here, for example, the lower elevations, we're gonna be able to start a little bit sooner. We warm up a little sooner. But if you move up to the higher elevations, you're gonna be waiting a little bit. You may not be able to plant until late in May, maybe even after Memorial Day. So it talks about when we can start our seeds. In fact, I'm starting my tomatoes and peppers now in the greenhouse. So then it tells you when you can put those seeds outdoors, when you can harvest. This is an extremely useful tool to use. And we also have one for planting your winter garden. So we do have one for cool season vegetables. So starting seeds indoors, it's really easy. The one thing that you wanna make sure that you do have is you wanna have a seed starting mix or a potting soil. And it does not need to have a lot of fertilizer in it because with that seed, that little tiny seed has everything in it to nourish it until it starts to grow roots and leaves. So you want a potting or a seed starting mix. It's light, it's fluffy. You want some containers. You can use any kind of containers. You can recycle yogurt cups. You can buy containers. The one thing is, is make sure they're good and clean and they're sanitary. Washing them in some good hot water. Um, and if you need to, you may, to disinfect, you might wanna put a little bleach or just some Lysol, some kind of a disinfectant to clean them out, make sure that there's nothing in them that could cause a problem. You need your seeds. You need a nice warm place. Um, many growers use um, heat mats. Once they've got them planted, they cover them and they use a seat mat and then they miss them a couple of times a day. And once they start coming up, they're going to need plenty of light. So once you've got your little seeds growing and they're looking very happy, we can start thinking about maybe transplanting them. I go through a couple of transplantings before they actually reach my garden bed. And I'm looking at these little guys here. These need another couple of weeks. They're still kind of small. Some of them still only have their seed leaves. These were definitely ready to be planted. And as you can see, I use some recycled solo cups. I just pumped some holes in the bottom for drainage and I transplanted in here. Some of these will um, go into gallon containers before I actually put them in the garden. But what you wanna do is once you have gone and you've transplanted, you wanna do a process called hardening off. That means taking your plants outside, putting them in the sun, maybe starting a half hour every day, bringing them in in the evening when it starts to get chilly. You're hardening them off. You're getting them used to the environment. Um, think of it this way. If you've been in a dark movie theater and you come out in the bright light, all of a sudden it's kind of a shock to your system and your eyes. That's how the plants kind of feel. If they've come in, they've been indoors and they've been all warm and toasty and all of a sudden you're putting them out in the bright sunlight. Do it gradually so they can build up you know, like, res like a resistance or get used to the air outside. So you're gonna harden off your transplants before you put them in the garden. Some vegetables don't like to be transplanted. Things like beans and peas, they prefer to be directly sown in the ground. So once your bed has reached the right temperature for you to plant outdoors, you're gonna, line off your row, planting in your row, each of your seeds, covering them up. Make sure that once you have planted a seed that you keep it moist so that it can continue to grow. Because if you let it dry out, that seed will no longer be viable. You need to keep them moist. So you're gonna plant them in the ground. But there is a workaround if you wanna get started with planting those vegetables that wanna be directly put in the ground like beans. You can use what's called peat pots, things made out of compressed peat moss. There's some that are called cow pots that are made out of compressed cow manure. There's little um, 
press pots that you know expand up and to a pod. Those are great to use for those vegetables because you can take and you can plant that whole thing in the ground, but make sure that you know all the edges are all covered with soil so it doesn't wick out the water. So we've talked about direct sowing our seeds. Let's talk a little bit about bugs. We have insects and mollusks. This is the first ones that show up in our yard are the aphids. The aphids have shown up early this year. I've been spraying aphids off since January. So aphids, just take and spray them off. We wanna leave a few of these in the garden so that when the ladybugs and the lace wings and the beneficials arrive, there's something for them to eat. As the weather warms, you're gonna notice the white flies. White flies are destructive as opposed to aphids. Aphids generally won't destroy a healthy plant, but white flies will. If you start noticing stippling, the little dots on your leaves that look like it's kind of yellowing, that's white fly damage. And white flies can be fairly easy to control. I use um, a yellow sticky trap and I put it out and I especially line them up in my greenhouse so that I can control the white flies in there. White flies were terrible last year. I lost a lot of plants to them. It just seemed like they were all over, but the yellow sticky traps also that works well, just hosing them off. Remember when you're managing, you wanna leave some for the good guys to eat. Grasshoppers, I don't see too many of these, but I have, a few grasshoppers don't react to any kind of pesticides or anything. The best way to deal with a grasshopper is to grab your shoe or your flip flop and just give them a good whack and then squash them and then they can go into the compost bin. Later in the summer, you're going to start seeing these guys come out on your tomato plants. The, they're not easy to spot. So what you do to spot a hornworm, you look down and if you see some little black dots down, that's called frass, which is another word for bug poop. You look down and then you look straight up into the plant. They're usually hiding up in there. The best time to check for these is either late in the evening or early in the morning. And the best way to deal with them, just hand pick them off. Hand pick them and get rid of them. If you have chickens or ducks or things like that, they make a really tasty treat. Later in the summer, as things warm up, we start to get our squashes growing. We'll start to see stink bugs. These can be terrible, well, terrible in your garden once they get started. Managing your garden, turning the leaves over on your plants. As you're going out and you're walking through, check the underseed because that's where you're gonna find eggs, and bugs under the leaf part of your plant. And you know, a lot of these can be either hosed off or if you've got a really serious infection, go to the UC Davis IPM website, which will tell you how to deal specifically with certain bugs. We also have these two little guys, they kind of go hand in hand, slugs and snails. It's right now, it's still a little bit cold, but as it warms, these guys are gonna be coming out and they're gonna be hungry. Snails and slugs are fairly easy to control. They can be hand-picked if you wanna to touch them. There's a number of homemade traps or things that you can try, um, but if you need to control them in a garden bed, try to use a product that has iron phosphate that's the least harmful to your vegetables and to your plants and to animals and children. So look for a product that has iron phosphate in it. So we've had some pests. Some of you, depending on where you live, may have rabbits. While they're cute, they're destructive in your garden. So fencing or using row cover may help discourage them. Sometimes we get raccoons in our yard. The best way is environmentally controlling them by not leaving things out like pet food, you know, dog food, cat food, 
um, kind of cleaning up and making sure that there's nothing out that's going to invite them into your yard. Rats can be another problem, especially in areas where they're doing a lot of new building. It kind of stirs up things. Rats are fairly easy to control using snap traps. If you have a compost bin, keep it moist and the rats will not like it. Unfortunately, you know, we have to live in with some of these critters, but we can also help control them. Our goal is control, not eradication. There are some people that live with these lovely creatures here, deer. Deer requires a little extra effort in putting up larger fences. You may have to put up a double fence. You may have to put up an eight foot fence to keep the deer out. And birds. Birds can be just as destructive as some animals, especially the gold finches. If you've planted tiny new little seedlings in your garden and you've gone out the next day and you're going, where are all my plants? Most likely culprit is gonna be the birds. They love those first greens. So cover your plants with a row cover or bird netting to try to you know, keep them out. And one thing I started doing is during the summer, I started planting sunflowers just for the birds so that they have something that they can eat and they leave my garden alone. So tips for success, develop a plan, prepare the soil, know your location, just like in real estate, location, location, location. Start small if you're a beginner, grow what you can use and what your family will eat. When you're buying plants, choose the healthiest plants available. When you're buying seeds, purchase fresh seeds. Manage your pests. But most of all, have fun. Getting outside, playing outside, doing in the gardening. It's all can be fun. So just enjoy it and enjoy the sunshine. Here's some information on um, my references that I use to help put this together. This will also be um, on the PowerPoint PDF on our website. <clears throat> and we want to thank you for coming today. Um, if you have more questions about raised bed gardening, container gardening, um, we have two excellent workshops posted on our YouTube channel. So you may want to check those out. So thank you. And I really appreciate all of you that came today. It has been awesome to get to present this to you. So I'm going to ask our moderator, Donna, do we have any questions from our audience today? Yes, Kathy, we do have several. Um, the first question is from Alex. It says, is it worth it to plant old seeds? And I think you kind of addressed that in your talk. It you know, it really depends, Alex. Um, if you've had the seeds for a while, some seeds can be viable for up to five years if they have been stored correctly. And that means in a dark container, you know, in a fairly cool, dry environment. Um, what, if you have a packet, Plant a few in, you know, a small container and see if they germinate. You know, it's always worth a try. Give it a go. Okay. The next one is from Jana. And her question is, when do you plant strawberry root like you can get in packs from the big box stores similar to bulbs? Oh, that's great. <clears throat> um, those can be start to get the, those planted as soon as it warms up a little bit. Um, I would check on the tags. Your strawberry plants are going to have a little tag because it's going to depend on where you live. It gives the name of the plant and all the information about it. Look at the back of it, see where you live and when you can plant that. Okay. The next one actually is a comment and I'm just going to read it. Um, it's a comment from Peggy, who's one of our master gardeners. <clears throat> but I, in case anybody hasn't been looking at the chat, if a six pack only has five plants in it, 
many nurseries will reduce the price if you don't really need the six plants. So that might be worth asking if you do happen to see a six pack that only has five or four plants in it. If that was all you wanted was five or four, just ask them to adjust the price. That was a really good comment. <clears throat> that is a very good comment and something worth seeing, especially if it's the last one of that variety that you wanted. It's always worth asking. Absolutely. Okay, the next question is from Jana again. If you use a seed heat mat to start tomatoes, do you only use it until they sprout or until you transfer it to a larger pot? I use it until I transfer it to a larger pot. Um, I want to keep those warm. I want to make sure that because I are in an unheated green, mine are in an unheated greenhouse. So I use that mat until I'm transplanting them into a larger pot. You want to keep that soil warm. Okay. Um, next question is kind of maybe about the same thing. What about thrips as pests? Thrips can be is another thing that can be really difficult to control. Um, I really recommend visiting um, the UC Davis IPM website. You can find a link to it on our on our website. They have everything there. They can tell you the I've never had to deal with thrips, but I know that they can be very difficult to deal with. So go to the IPM website. And for home gardeners, type in thrips, and they will give you a whole list of things that you can do to help control those. Thank you. Okay, one more question from Jana. If leaf miners were a problem last year, <clears throat> pardon me, will the bed have the same problem this year? It depends. I don't know. That's a good question. That I really don't, like, and that, again, IPM website. Um, oh, that's what I was just going to say. That would be a good place to look. Um, here's another um, from Jay Pallavi. Uh, seedling soil or compost? Uh, many YouTube videos say to use compost for seedlings. Um, well, as a master gardener, I only present research-based information. If you're transplanting a seedling, you've already used your seed starting mix, you've used your potting mix, and you're transplanting it, yes, that's a time to add some compost. But you want to keep that beginning soil as sterile as possible. So that's why it's, you know master gardeners recommend using a sterile seed starting medium. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's the end of the questions that we have right now, Kathy. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise on vegetable gardening. I think everybody's going to be inspired to go out and start digging in their yard and getting ready. I so, hope so. I think they will. Um, anyway, for the rest of you, let me remind you that in the next couple of days, you will be able to find a link to the handouts and to this recorded workshop at pcmg.ucanr.org under uh, virtual gardening workshops. You can also check our listing there for future virtual workshops. Those are listed under upcoming events. <clears throat> and if you run into problems in your garden or you just have a question, you can always click on the Ask a Master Gardener link that you will see in the left-hand column of our website homepage. <clears throat> Remember, if you live in a different county or a different area of the world, be sure to consult your local master gardeners or other experts about geographical or climatic differences in your garden. And I just wanna thank all of you for participating today. And again, thanks to Kathy. Um, we hope to see you all at another uh, virtual workshop sometime soon. Thank you.